it's great to have everybody here. And I'm sure we'll have a few more people joining us off and on throughout the, the morning presentation. Um, I know the staff from Hilltop that, that are here, obviously, but I'd love to get a better sense of how many professionals we have here and how many parents. So, um, Meredith, if you, if you read off the names on your um, intake list on the, to the right of the screen, then we might be able to get a hello and a I'm a parent of a, you know, fifth grader, or I'm a parent of sure. a ninth grader. That would be really nice to hear. Sure. So um, first, I just have a phone number. It says 610, and you end in 02. Is there anybody, are you able to unmute yourself? And this might be a parent. Uh, next, we have Alice Callison. No, um, 610 is going to speak. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. She had unmuted, okay. so. No worries. Alice. Um, Allison, can you hear us? Or Alice, can you hear us? Yes, I, yes, I can hear you. Hello. Um, I'm, uh, I guess I ca classify as a professional. I'm from um, Benchmark School, actually. So I was, we're very interested oh, in your format. Hi, how are you? Uh, so Good. we are, you know, I, we're just, we'd love to see what you guys are up to and, and how you're managing this because um, we're, I'm, we're just interested in your format and how things are going. So, uh, okay. so just here to enjoy it. Okay, thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Um, next, the login name is Apollo Spice. Are you able to unmute? Hi, my name is Julie Cottage, actually, and I'm a parent. Hi, uh, um, our daughter is graduating 10th grade and uh, from boarding school. And so looking to uh, find a nice fit for her for 11th grade. Great. Thank you. Uh, next is Ashley Feeler. Ms. Feeler, is this Teresa Feeler? Maybe she's yeah. oh, there she is. Yes. Yes, this is Teresa Filer and Jeff Filer. We're parents of um, Adam Filer, who's a ninth, a ninth grader right now. Great. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Next, we have Betty wasn't able to introduce her or able to um, unmute her mic. Betty, if you just want to type in, um, if, if you're a parent or a professional, that would be helpful. And then I'll just read it to everybody. Um, next is Diana Collins. Hi, Diana. Hi, how are you, Mary? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Absolutely. Can you just share with our group? Um, I know who you are, but who you are and where you're from? Of course. Of course. My name is Diana Collins, and I work at the Baldwin School. And like many of the professionals here, um, we are reimagining uh, how we communicate the value of Baldwin. So I was very grateful uh, that Meredith has um, invited me to participate. So, so thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, next up, we have Herb Hess. Hi, Herb. Herb and I have talked on the phone many, many, many times. And we've been trying to reschedule and schedule around the social distancing. So he's here today at our open house. Hess or Herb, are you there? I'm here. Delighted to be here, Meredith. Thank you for the invite. Uh, I've got a rising ninth grader, Jeffrey Hess, um, and uh, we're excited to learn more about the school. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Herb. Uh, next, we have Jamie McKim. Jamie, can you hear us? Nope, she's not unmuting. Okay, well, welcome, Jamie. There we go. Sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, hi, Jamie. Hi. I'm not used to Google Hangouts very much. I'm more um, familiar with Zoom. Um, so, yes, I have a rising sixth grader just looking um, at schools in the area, and I'm um, loving that this is a, you know, a virtual format just because I'm home with my kids, and it gives me the opportunity to still see some schools. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. Uh, next, I have Julie Montgomery, who just joined. Hi, Julie. Hi, 
Oh, okay. Well, welcome, Julie. Um, if you want to type in the text box um, who you are and your your student that you're here for, that would be great. Um, next, I have just Lily, and Lily is Jill is. Jillian McIntosh, and she's parent to Caleb Morton, who is a current seventh grader at Welsh Valley Middle School, and she's interested in learning more about the school, so welcome. And next we have Nicholas Chapman. Can you hear us? Hi, Nicholas. Hi. Um, I, I guess you call me a professional. I'm from the Janus School. I'm here with uh, Robin Payne, and we're just really interested in your format, just like Alice, uh, and see how you guys are doing this whole new world. Thank you guys. Thank you both so much for joining us. I appreciate Thanks. it. And we have Patricia, I'm going to say wrong, Posis. Yes. Hi, Patty. Meredith. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm, good. I'm Patty Posis. I'm from the Stratford Friends School. Um, and thank you so much for letting me join you um, in navigating these waters <laughs> in the admissions world as of today. So thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Is there anybody that I didn't name? Those are, we have 18 people on the call. Does anyone else want to say a hello before we get started? Okay, awesome. Tom, you can go right ahead. Terrific. Um, it's great to have everybody here. And it's exciting to be one of the first to do this and to have the professionals join us. So you're more than welcome to engage in the conversation. And as Meredith said, we look at this as a time to, to talk and share a little bit about Hilltop. So um, I believe everyone received uh, a, th a three colored sheet of paper. Um, They'll get it at the end. They'll, they'll get, get it at up. the end. Then, yep. um, Cindy, if you would put up the first slide um, while she's doing that, I'll explain what we're we're doing. What Cindy's going to put up is um, a series of slides that build a, a presentation. This is the one piece that that I do at each open house. This is a document when it's all done, it will make a lot more sense to you. And I'm gonna walk through the construction of this. When, when we have people here in real time, um, we're sitting around uh, the room in round tables and they take out this particular sheet of paper and I explain all of the different elements of it. And it's a way, we call it a, a hilltopism. It's not, it has no copyright, it, you won't find it in a textbook. But over the, the last 10 years, this is how we have begun to see students that are the most successful here and also how, where we might look to other schools to be helpful. So we explain to parents that we see learning as a continuum and that blue line across the middle of the, of the piece of paper that they have in front of them talks about this, this spectrum or this continuum of learning and struggles with learning as well as the side of success in learning. If you look at the left and think of a student just starting out, a child just starting out uh, in school, they begin by learning to read and uh, they have to learn the sound, the identification of letters, the sounds of letters, how to blend those sounds together to make words. And then as they get older and they move more to the middle of that blue line and they're in middle school, they're beginning to do just the opposite. They're learning uh, through their reading. So they're reading to learn information. So the blue line is from the left uh, as you start in nursery school and kindergarten to the right when you get to, um, we think of it as graduation from high school because that's what we do here, but we're also obviously preparing people for college. So we see this as a continuum starting at the beginning on the left and moving to the right. So if we have the next slide, please. If you struggle in the beginning of your school experience, um, and therefore difficulty learning to read, you might be struggling because of language-based issues. And if I could have the next slide. Great. 
Um, sometimes, and, and this happens at Hilltop more often than some of our colleagues in schools working with more language-based kids, we often will get a family that'll come along and say, we don't know what's happening. The wheels are starting to fall off. They started falling off around fifth grade. Um, but up until that point, we had great relationships with the teachers. Uh, our son or our daughter was coming along beautifully. But when we started getting into the middle school years, we found that things were much more difficult. Um, Meredith says she just emailed this chart to everyone. So somewhere it, along, along the point where if you could, um, somebody just joined us, if you could mute your, your microphone, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. So anyway, the idea is that um, if you're not struggling from language-based issues, you're struggling maybe perhaps from something we refer to as performance-based issues. And that often can start um, later in school career. So if I could have the next slide, this will all start to make a little bit more sense. So we've de de uh, designed this sheet to look at three different areas of learning. We look at the characteristics of students when they're struggling, and then the diagnostic labels that often go with those characteristics. So if you're struggling with language-based issues, you're having problems with decoding words, you're, you certainly are having trouble with spelling, you would have difficulties with reading comprehension. Um, and I, we also talk with the parents about the fact that if an IQ is built with um, two scores of performance and also verbal, in this situation where language is the problem, the verbal side of the IQ can often be lower than the performance side. So a lower verbal and higher performance. The diagnostic labels often found with these kinds of characteristics are things like dyslexia and reading difficulties. If I could have the next slide. Great. And at the other end of the spectrum or the other end of the continuum, when you're not struggling with reading and learning uh, to work with language, but you are struggling in school, there are other areas not so much associated with reading that may come up as difficulties. And the print on this is a little bit smaller, but essentially we are seeing things like high levels of anxiety. And it's interesting over the last five years, the preponderance of anxiety in students has continued to grow. We're seeing it more prevalent um, in more of our uh, accepted students. Trouble making friends, the social side of things becomes more of an issue because of course, as you get older, the social side of things is much more important. Um, so poor social skills or social pragmatics, we're finding a lot of success with um, the addition of some folks here that work on social pragmatics and the practical side of language. Trouble integrating sensory information and weak auditory processing, difficulty with word retrieval, and often benefiting from occupational therapy and speech and language and counseling. All three of those things relate to a lot of the other characteristics here uh, that we see in students at Hilltop. Uh, we do have a full-time occupational therapist. We also have a speech and language person, but, but um, even though Michael's experience is in training is in speech and language, he's the one working a great deal with language and the pragmatics around language and is amazingly successful in working with students on their social interactions. And counseling, as you'll hear from Cindy Falcone, uh, is an integral part of this program where every student is involved in a, a counseling group and they're working on social skills. They're not working on, on a therapy as you would on an individual basis. Inferential comprehension can be weak, um, tends to struggle with abstract and, more, and will be more successful in the concrete world trouble transitioning from one activity to another. That's really easy to understand how when you're in the early grades, you're in a self-contained classroom, you have one teacher with one set of rules, um, that teacher uh, is warm and supportive and we all open up our books and learn together. But as you start to get older, the teacher's grades are increase in number 
And so do the expectations from classroom to classroom. And the organization around getting from one class to another also can be a bit of a problem. So um, getting from one activity to another is something we hear a great deal uh, from our families. Uh, struggles with synthesizing information. If you're going from class to class, if you have different sets of expectations from teacher to teacher, the assignments are getting longer with more and more details. Pulling all that together and synthesizing it into one, one thought or one final report or um, one daily schedule can all be things that you struggle with. In this case, we see the IQ being, again, made up of verbal and performance, but we find the verbal to be higher and the performance lower. And then also, we find these students to be quite strong in the areas of computer and math and science. If they're good in math, they often can struggle a bit with geometry. So let's look at the labels that often go with some of these characteristics, and that's up at the top. So pervasive development disorder or developmental disorder, the PDD, we're seeing less of here. It's a diagnosis that was used more prevalently a number of years ago. Nonverbal learning disabilities also relating to a similar profile as Asperger's. Um, and of course, we're not seeing those two labels as much. The high functioning autism being on the high end of the autism spectrum is something we see more and more. The trouble with math, the dyscalculia, is, is an older label, and we see it very rarely now. And here's a change. Here's a thing that's coming. When we first did this chart and started building it about 10 years ago, we were uh, very aware of some of our students coming through with a diagnosis of ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. And we're not seeing as much of that uh, as we used to. But what we are seeing is this OCD, this obsessive compulsive um, needs, the, the need for repetitive behaviors to make us feel comfortable. We're seeing more and more of that and see it being tied to anxiety um, and, the, and the social difficulties. So now let's go to the middle. So if you would uh, move to the next slide, please. Um, here's another set of characteristics. The reason they're in the middle is that we see them being shared by both the left-hand column and the right-hand column. So if you're struggling with language-based issues or you're struggling with performance-based issues, you often will see some of these characteristics as well. Trouble attending to task and sitting still, managing time effectively, struggling with written expression, difficulties with fine and gross motor demands, visually art artistic. Um, that's not something often our families see their children as being strong in. Um, we find that there are lots of artistic students here that are not aware of their abilities or their strengths because often if they're in a public school setting, the places that they're being taken from in the schedule are usually the arts programs because they're, they're a great place to pull a student out of a program and put them into a resource room for additional support. So they don't often get to express themselves artistically. And I encourage as you leave this particular presentation, if we were all in the um, large commons for our meeting, when you go on the tour to look at all of our permanent art collection, we have quite a bit of work, a lot of murals and mosaics on the walls around campus. And then struggling with organization and study skills. Those executive function skills can really start to show up in middle school and they just continue to grow in the older grades. So those are shared in a, by both the left-hand column and the right. If you look up above in the middle column, here are some of the labels, the executive function skills I already talked about. ADHD is probably the most prevalent of the diagnoses that we see in students that are here at Hilltop. LDNOS is more of a collection uh, diagnosis or label that we don't see very much and dysgraphia um, with the with the advent of all of the one-to-one -one computer laptop programs like we have here at Hilltop, um, it's become less and less of an issue. So just a couple more slides to go, but we get to add the color. So if you would, yeah, great, thanks, Cindy. So if, and some of our colleagues at schools like this are in this yellow box, we are blessed with an abundance of opportunities and options for parents in this neighborhood, in this area, 
for uh, students with language-based issues. And uh, the Stratford Friends and the Benchmarks of the World, the AIM, uh, Quaker School of Horsham, uh, are all schools that are very well known for doing a great job, Woodland, De uh, Delaware Valley Friends, with students who are struggling with learning to work with language. And so they're the ones that are grouped here in for us in this yellow box, the labels above and the characteristics below. Now, if we add the last slide, there you go. Now you see a, a larger box around the yellow that is creating a um, pink box of the middle columns and the right-hand column. Now, the reason this is important to us is this is how we see, this is where we see the most success. So if you look at the characteristics in the middle column, the um, kind of shrimp colored and the, the pink on the right, those are the characteristics that we feel we're the most successful with. It's Those are the characteristics that we build our program around. And those are the characteristics and the program for the labels above that set ourselves a little bit apart from uh, our colleagues that are working more with language-based issues. Um, we trade students back and forth. There will often be students that will come from Quaker School or from uh, Stratford Friends, for example, and will uh, finish there and come to us. And uh, we often see students in Meredith's office who are more language-based, and therefore we send them to uh, look at some of our colleagues and to meet with them. So this is only meant uh, it's not cut and dry. It's not a black and white kind of thing. It's very colorful, um, but it's also not set in stone. It just gives us a way of looking at students and grouping them a little bit um, and also bringing that information to the parents so that they can see it in a, in a kind of concrete way. So that's the hilltopism, the way that we look at, at the kids that we serve. And I'll turn it back to Meredith and um, entertain any questions as we move along in the in the conversation, but we have some really great people to talk about the program. Absolutely, Cindy will be up next. Um, again, if you have any questions as she's going through the presentation, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask. If there are no questions, I'll, I'll continue on with the, the presentation. So give me a minute to put everything back up for you. There we go. So as Tom mentioned, um, we, we have a, a specific group of students that we um, that we work with on a on a day to day basis. And and um, as someone that that works and looks at the academic program um, with all of the teachers and, and the the uh, team leaders and department chairs, we're often looking at the the program and how to best serve the students that are coming through our door. And each year, they, while they may share the same diagnoses, the reality is, is they're all really different individuals and, and we work to adjust as we go through. The one thing that we find that all of our students need, no matter what, is a supportive learning environment. Um, we find that some of our kids have um, come from school environments um, that, that haven't been so pleasant. Um, they may have been bullied, they felt like they haven't been um, supported, um, and, and they really need that, that extra support so that that way they can learn to trust us and really learn to take those educational risks that we hope for them to take. In doing that, we're often talking about what does our program need to look like so that that way we are providing that supportive environment. And, and right now, um, even with the online instruction that we're, we're providing, the reality is, is that still needs to pro be provided even though we're not together. So I, I find whether we are at Hilltop or um, working remotely, this is a, an important piece of the Hilltop puzzle. Um, so a lot of things that we're, we're doing right now um, and, and in general, um, we have an integrated team approach. So we are still talking um, as, as faculty members. We are um, working together, we're working as a team, whether it be in our departments, in our grade level meetings, in our um, 
middle school, ninth grader, upper school teams so that that way we're providing an integrated approach to, to what we're doing. Um, it's we're, we're making sure that there's there's structure and there's a plan for, for our kids so they can really meet with success. There are a lot of ways that we do that, but one of the key pieces is the small class sizes that we have to offer. Um, when you do get to come to Hilltop to see the, the campus, you'll see that the class, classes are small. They are not meant to fit 20, 30 kids in there. It's it's really not possible. They would be really packed if that were the case. Um, our classes are meant to fit that five to eight range for students. What that allows us to do is really get to know the students well. It allows the students to get us know, uh, to know us well, and we're able to make the adjustments that that we need to make to support them as as learners, which allows us to provide that individualized instruction that we know that our students need. Um, there are a lot of ways that that we're doing that, and and the individualized part of the instruction begins even with their their own academic schedule. So one of my jobs as um, the, the assistant head for program is that I look at, um, okay, what, what is it that this student needs in terms of, of courses? Um, our kids come with very, very specific areas of, of need, but they also come with really amazing strengths as well. So making sure that we're, we're finding that balance between providing support where we need to provide support and, and pushing where we can push um, is, a, is an important piece of the Hilltop puzzle. So it starts with, with scheduling the students and providing that the classes that they, they need, um, regardless of what grade they might be in. And then within the classroom, the teachers have the ability to make some adjustments as well. So we have something called a phasing system at Hilltop that allows us to provide support within the classroom. So they're in the class that they, they need to be um, scheduled in, but how do we then individualize things from there? For some students, it could mean that we're providing accommodations and those accommodations could be things like extended time or scribing or, um, uh, use of a word bank more during a, a quiz or a test, things along those lines. Um, all of our kids um, are, are utilizing a laptop, so they're, they're able to use that. Sometimes it could be um, using speech to text for, for any written assignments, things along those lines. So those students might be at, at a, what we call a with accommodations phase. However, at the other end of the spectrum, we may have kids that this is their area of strength. Um, so this is a, a, a subject area where um, it, it really is something that comes easily to them and they are really up for a challenge. And for those students, we might have them working at what we call an advanced phase, in which case we're going to provide the push and the um, the the, the extra work or extra enrichment, I guess is the best way to put it, so that that way they're being challenged. And then for most students, they're falling at, in between all of that. We're falling in between what's called an instructional phase. So most of our kids are doing what we need them to do in the classes that they are placed in and they're, they're meeting with those expectations. The great part about the phasing system is it can vary from class to class. It can vary throughout the year and we're able to make adjustments um, quickly as the student needs it. So for example, you might have a student that has um, a diagnosis of um, a disorder of written expression. So they might have difficulty in, say, their, their uh, seminar class or their language arts class, and we might need to provide them with extra support in, in that realm. At the same time, math might be an area of strength for them, and this is something where they, they really, really do well. And we'd say, okay, we, we're they need the push there. So they might be at, say, an advanced phase in their math class. They might need accommodations in their language arts class. Um, but say in their science class, they might just be working at the instructional phase. We can adjust their, their phases and the supports they're receiving from class to class. It could also change throughout the year. So for example, um, students often transitioning or coming into Hilltop. Um, it could be that they are not as is, is um, willing or trustworthy of, of, of teachers in school yet. It's a transition. It might be something really new to them and they may be feeling a little bit more anxious upon their arrival. As they 
are coming in, they might need the extra support. They might need some accommodations, whether it's seeing their counselor or seeing their mentor or their teachers during mentor period or whatever the case may be. We might need to put some extra supports in as they, as they transition to the new environment. As they become more acclimated though, we might find that they're becoming more confident, more independent, which is what we're hoping for. And we would be able to adjust that phase. So we might say, okay, let's pull back on some of those supports and accommodations so that that way we can make sure that they're we're, we're challenging them and so we might have them go to then an instructional phase so that that way um, they're they're functioning more independently sometimes the reverse is true as well where you know a student might start off the year well and and as things become more challenging we need to put in more supports there's a lot of flexibility within the the uh, phasing system that allows us to make those adjustments as we need to to make those adjustments and and that um happens really fluidly at Hilltop because the teams are communicating and the teachers are communicating so well so that that way things are not left so that the student is really um, you know struggling and, and hits rock bottom we're, we're making sure that we're addressing it early on so the student feels supported we're talking a lot with the students um, throughout their classes and, and throughout the year about self-advocacy so we really want them to work on being able to express what it is that they need so that that way we are able to, to support them appropriately and we find when they students feel like they're being heard and they're being supportive they're they're willing and able to take those risks that we would hope them to take in in a classroom or in life and and that's ultimately what we're looking for for a lot of our kids is for them to be ready for that for, for that next challenge and take on that next level of, of responsibility one another way that we do this and provide them with the support so there's the supports within the classroom and the phasing system and the teacher support but we also have a mentoring program so all hilltop faculty um, function as an academic mentor so we have uh, anywhere three usually three or four students that that we mentor we have a mentor period every day in the middle of the day and it's a time when we can kind of check in. Um, I'm one of the, the academic mentors and, and what that might look like for my mentees is that it might be that we're, we're looking at grades, um, we're looking at um, how, are, how are they doing organizationally, we're looking at if there's an issue with test taking, how do we to remedy that it could be that i'm modeling the advocate you know the advocacy if the student isn't quite ready yet and they're new to hilltop you know i'm modeling that with them so that that way they can see what it should look like and make sure that we um, build those skills over time you know prior to the laptop days it, it would often be you know those regular book back bag cleanouts with all the papers and things like that in them just because we had to really focus on organization it's a great resource for for the students um, and it's also a great resource for parents so if they're a student is struggling at home with homework or there seems to be a challenge this is a person that um, parents can also contact and really say hey this is what's happening at home you know what can what can we do and and you know we're able to make some adjustments and that mentor functions really as that liaison for the for the student in the academic realm the other piece of the puzzle though is the social emotional piece um, so we're really working to provide support there as well because we want to really look at the whole student and we do have a counseling program at Hilltop all of our students participate in group counseling twice a week for 40 minutes um, they are able to bring you know concerns to group if they if they would like to um, sometimes if there's also a curriculum that is planned by our, our group counselors we have four full-time uh, counselors on on staff so they are are available but the, those same counselors are also available to students on a one-on-one -on -one basis so if a student is having a rough day a rough class period um, they they have that um, additional support and they may go see their counselor as needed and set up those extra appointments um, as needed so we have the counselor that's really looking at the social emotional piece of things we have the mentor that's kind of overseeing the academic piece of things the mentor and counselor are really working closely together to, to make sure there's you know we're supporting the student appropriately again this is another great resource for parents as well so if things are going on at home and and especially right now with all that's going on in the world 
being able um, for us to communicate with parents is, is a great piece of the puzzle so that that way we are also supporting the fam the, the families and making sure we're, we're providing that, you know, singular message and making sure that we're all working together for the betterment of, of the student. Um, the same counseling uh, group or team at Hilltop also reaches out to outside professionals as well. So if, if given um, a release and permission to do so, we will absolutely work with outside therapists and psychiatrists and things of that nature so that that way we're, we're kind of all on the same page and making sure that we're supporting the students the way we need to support them. <coughs> Through all of this, um, we are looking at the student's daily schedule and saying, how, how is it that we can support them in that? So as I mentioned, the kids are going to have mentor period, as you can see, smack dab in the, the middle of the day. Um, so it's a time when they can see with their mentors or go to see teachers for extra help or extended time or whatever it is that they happen to meet, need. Part of their schedule is that, that group counseling that I mentioned as well. It's not a pullout kind of thing, so it's part of their, their weekly program and it's part of those core periods that, that we talked about. The other piece that we look at at Hilltop in terms of supporting our students when we're reading a lot of the, the files and information that we're receiving about what our students need, we find that breaks are an important piece of the puzzle. Um, and we've kind of built those into our schedule, as you can see. So we ha typically have, you know, first and second period in the morning, and then we have our community meeting and break. And this is a time when we all come to together in our meeting room, we make announcements, uh, celebrate birthdays, um, all of those kinds of fun things so that that way we're making sure that we are um, making kids aware of any changes that we might be be making, celebrating the accomplishments. Uh, it might be awarding some spirit of the hawks um, that, that we're giving to students for courage, perseverance, service, um, or leadership. It's a, it's a great time for us to come together. And then the students have a bit of a break. It's a time to, to decompress a little bit, hang out with friends. It might be that they're, you know, out back walking on the lawn um, or on the back patio, just hanging out with some, some friends for a few minutes before they go on to third and fourth period. Then we have mentor period and lunch. Um, again, we're providing opportunities for them to, to either be in the gym or be outside so that that way they, they have that time to just really um, get ready and, and prepare for the next round of classes. We have uh, our last three periods of academic periods of the day, and then we have what's called activity period. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But the activity period is, is again, a time for, for us to come together in, in, as a community um, and with peers and, and other students that have similar interests. You'll notice that on Wednesday down at the bottom, there is a dismissal at 240, and, and that is um, the case. And the reason we do the early dismissal is Wednesday is often a, a meeting day for faculty. So as I mentioned earlier on, um, it's a time when we can come together in teams or departments or grade levels and, and really collaborate and, and find that integrated uh, team approach that we are hoping to, to put together for all of our students and make those changes as we need to make them as quickly as we, we need to make them. Throughout all of this, communication is huge. So whether it be, you know, we're communicating as is teachers um, within the school, but it's also communication is really important between the home and school, school and professionals, uh, professionals and school, and every variation therein. The more we are all talking to, to each other, the better we are able to support the, the students in creating that integrated approach, but also making sure that we're supporting them so that they can really take those risks, build their skills, become strong self-advocates, really know who they are and what they need, and, and are able to go on and, and plan for, for the future. One of the ways that we communicate, and we're, we're doing it right now, is through technology. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have been to our, our website and, and looked at the information that's available there. Um, but we also use technology throughout the, the school year as well through our student information system. We use this to um, 
let parents and students know assignments that are coming up. Um, it, it allows us to give grades in the moment. Um, it allows us to provide that information that a lot of our families need. Um, we absolutely realize that you know, in the school day, you know, between eight and four, when we're typically on campus, that we may not always, you might not always be available to, to talk to talk with the teacher or find out how your child did on that test or what assignments might be coming up. And this is a way for, for, for parents and students and mentors and counselors all to have the same information because we all have access to the, the same portal and through the same system. Um, it's, it's a great way for students to, to go on and say, hey, this is, this is the work that I need to do. It does create individualized work calendars or assignment calendars for students so they can see what's, what's coming up. We can see grades in real time, and, and I have to say right now, um, I am on our student information system often throughout the day, you know, checking in on my, um, the students that I mentor, checking in on other students and making sure that, that things are happening. And this is a great way for us to easily get information and, and communicate with each other and, and make sure that we're all on the same page. So we do use technology in our, our, our portal to do that. Gmail is another um, important piece of the puzzle. We are we do use the Google Suite um, often. Um, all of our students, all of our faculty have a Hilltop email address that we are we are utilizing on a regular basis. And all of our students do have um, laptops that we loan them. Um, we have a one-to-one -one laptop initiative. Uh, we have loaned all of our students the, uh, a MacBook Air, and they are using them feverishly right now. And we're so thankful to have that um, technology and information um, and resource at our at our fingertips. So our kids are using the the MacBook Air. Um, they are using them in class. There are a wealth of resources that are available to our students as a result. The great part of la the laptop is that it really helps our students with a lot of the things that, that they struggle with. So for example, it helps with things like executive function because we're working with them and we're, we're teaching them how to create the folders they need to create save documents with an appropriate um, title rather than it being stuff one, two, three. It's, it could be I would like you to save this as titled as this and in this folder. So they're learning to organize uh, their, their technology. Um, they're learning to email and communicate appropriately um, from a virtual standpoint, which has been really important in the last few weeks. Um, they are use, learning to use this technology to their benefit. Some students are using the speech to text functionality, but there are constantly resources that are available from a technological standpoint that allow our students to really show who they are and what they can do despite challenges that they might have. Within the classroom, um, we do have um, smart TVs in every single classroom. So teachers and students are able to share their screens and pr present that information. We're able to bring the outside world in and use uh, you know, FaceTime or other resources to, to do that. Even today, even though we are not in school, we are still using the resources that are available through the smart technology to really convey instruction even though we're, we're not together. So it is an important um, piece of the, the puzzle. And when you do get on campus uh, in the future, you will see the, the technology is not just with the students, but is also in the classroom. Because we really want to make sure that we're utilizing the resources that are available to us to, to provide a multi-sensory approach to instruction that really is what our students need. And then of course, there's assistive technology um, and assistive software that is always helpful. Um, one big piece of the puzzle that we use is a piece of software called Kurzweil 3000. It allows us to scan textbooks and um, resources and PDFs and worksheets, and it will read the information to the students. So for um, students that, that may have uh, issues with visual processing or even visual impairments, it allows them to hear it versus having to see it. Um, the ability to um, enlarge things as they need to um, is another great piece of the puzzle. Speech to text software is, is wonderful. There are so many benefits and, and ways that we can use the, the laptop to really help our students meet their, their academic um, potential. And it's really an important piece of the puzzle. However, 
in the classroom and learning in the classroom is not the only thing that we want to focus on at Hilltop. Um, we really, really want to have opportunities for our kids to be part of a community and to really experience learning outside of the Hilltop environment. Um, for a lot of our students, school was simply, I go to, um, I go to school and I come home from school and they weren't part of clubs. They weren't part of um, te uh, sports teams. They, they really, this many, you know, um, we've heard, didn't have a lot of friends to, to kind of hang out with on weekends. We want them to have that experience. We Hilltop, we want that community and it's really, really an important piece of the puzzle. And there are different parts of the program that we've put into place that allow us to come together on as a community on a regular basis. So as I mentioned earlier, um, activities was a period at the, the end of the day. Um, it's the last 40 minutes of, of our day, um, four days a week. And what this allows us to do is provide opportunities for kids to hang out with other, other students, um, get to know teachers in a different way, meeting around an area of interest. So for example, it could be that they are part of the Hilltop house band. It could be that um, they are, um, it could be arts and crafts related or, or visual arts related. It could be that performing arts or sports um, and athletically inclined, it could have to do with technology and coding and, and all of these different opportunities that that might be available for our students. The students get to choose two activities per semester. So they get to say, okay, here are two two different things I'd like to be a part of. So they're getting to know their peers in a different in a different way and they're getting to come together um, to around a similar interest, which is a really nice thing to see. And they build their friendships that way, which is also really nice. Another way they do this is through athletic teams. Um, you know, Hilltop is a, a unique place. We, while we are a, a small school, we have uh, 90 students enrolled um, this year in grades five through 12. The reality is, is if they would like to participate in a team, we want them to participate in a team. Um, we have opportunities for athletics throughout the entire, entire year. Um, and we are, um, in competition for many of those um, teams with other other schools similar to us. <coughs> for our students, they may have never been part of a, of a team before, ever. They may have never played the sport before, and that is okay. Um, they are co-ed teams. They are... Um, no cut. Um, we, if they've never done it before, I want to give it a shot. We really want them to to take that risk and really give it a shot. So in the 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 fall, we have soccer and cross country. Um, if they would like to participate in those, they may. They may find that they really enjoy playing soccer. Um, some kids don't. That's okay. They don't. They can choose a different team at a different time. Um, we also are offer uh, things like um, horseback riding. So we have a partnership with Thorncroft Equestrian Center and both in the fall and the spring, that is an opportunity for them. A newer partnership this year, it's not necessarily athletic, but it is um, something, an after school activity that they can do as well. Um, it's it's learning how to, to do um, dog walking. Um, so it's another opportunity that the students have um, in the, the fall as well. Then in the winter months, um, we have basketball as the, the primary sport, but there's also the opportunity to be part of a bowling team. That was something that started um, a couple of years ago with our um, students initiating it, that something that they really wanted to do. So uh, we have a bowling team that they can participate in or they can do basketball as well. And then in the spring, which would typically be now, so we're, we're missing out on some of those, it's typically golf, tennis, and outdoors club. Outdoor, outdoors club actually was student initiated as well. Um, it's for kids that really wanted to be together, wanted to, to do something out, outside and, and where they're, they're physically active, um, but they didn't want to do anything with, you know, competitive sports. So 
they go hiking um, in different locations. Uh, they might go, uh, you know, um, tubing down the Brandywine. They might uh, go paintballing or they might go camping. Um, and they do all kinds of things that are, that are outside, fun um, activities, but um, really without that competitive nature. But again, we really want the kids to, to, to give it a shot if they, they'd like to. Um, like I said, this is all about um, building community and we want them to, to be part of it. Um, it does run after the school day which sometimes presents a challenge to, to some of our students because they do live um, a distance away. That's okay. Um, we really, we are reception to scale. She works really hard with the, um, the different parents and, and families and really um, we work it out, whether it's we work on carpooling or taking the kids to the train station or whatever it is so we can make sure that the kids are part of the community and being able to participate in those team sports that they want to participate in. Sports, however, isn't for, for everybody. We do have a, a wealth of students that are really artistically inclined. And when you go to get on campus, what you will see is there's art all over campus. Um, there are um, installations um, that, that are larger that are in place, um, permanent, you know, Tom refers to as our permanent collection, whether it be a mosaic, um, sculptures, um, you name it, it is all over the campus. Art is a really important piece of the, the puzzle for, for many of our kids. And kids in uh, grades five through nine automatically have art as part of their academic schedule. Um, students in grades 10 through 12, if they, they can continue to take art electives, if that's something that, that is really important to them. We also offer an artworks program after school as well. So if students, um, just want to get together and and create art together um, after school, really with no pressure, no grades, anything like that, there's an opportunity for that as well, because it is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, whether it be the visual arts or the performing arts, um, it, it's something that our students really feel passionately about and is something that we uh, continue to build into our program because it's really important for them. Typically, <laughs> we are taking our kids off campus as well and really getting them involved in a variety of, of class trips and opportunities. Um, we're spending a lot of time at school, you know, teaching skills and talking about um, social skills and all of those wonderful things. But the best way to practice those social skills is to go off campus and go out in the community and really, really utilize them. More importantly, it gives us an opportunity to take our instruction and, and really expand upon it. So say, for example, in the Eastern world cultures, rather than just talking about various religions, so, you know, Judaism or um, Christianity or you name, pick a religion, um, rather than just talking about it, we're taking kids to, um, churches and mosques and having them learn a little bit more about the religion firsthand. Um, for other kids, it might be that they're reading a play and then we go and we see the play um, performed. It could be service projects that we're taking uh, our students on as well. We are often taking the kids off campus. It's an important um, piece of, of, of Hilltop's um, plan and journey for, for our kids. We really encourage getting off campus and, and, and utilizing those skills that we're teaching within our classes and within our, in, within our groups. And these are, again, things that, that bond our students together. So class trips are often happening in conjunction, whether uh, to a class or a particular grade level. But there are also opportunities um, outside of that. So typically at the end of every school year, we have something called Spirit Week. And it's, it's four days that we have dedicated to the school year where we're not focusing really on the academics as much as we are on other opportunities. So um, it could be that the Spirit Week um, opportunity you choose has to do with community service. It could be that um, you're, you're building a structure on campus. If you see the picture down in the, the, the bottom right, um, that is an installation that is on Helltop's campus and it's right outside of our gym. It's an outdoor classroom and it was um, the idea of some of our, 
our students and they really wanted an outdoor classroom. So it was a group of students that came together and worked with some outside professionals and they built the outdoor door classroom that is still part of our campus. Another year, it was a, a, a patio next to our middle school that, that a group of ninth graders really came together and put together during spirit week. It could also be um, trips or performing arts. We have a group of students that are really into role-playing games. So we've had some that have been focused upon that. All of the trips are incorporate getting off campus at some point in time. Um, some are off campus the entire time. Uh, we had one year where the kids were going, um, they were traveling to um, different different areas and their lodging was tree houses. Um, so they they were staying in different tree houses and in different areas and they did that for, for four days. So it's a really, really wonderful experience for the kids to come together in. Um, and, and a lot of opportunities are available. And this is something that is important to us and, and, and occurs at the end of the year. Then there are also larger travel experiences. Um, these are kids that are entering uh, grades uh, 10 through post-grad, and they range anything from shorter trips, so something like, uh, you know, spending a couple days um, uh, on Assateague Island. It could be uh, shorter things like uh, ski trips or camping trips, um, but it also could be larger international trips. So we have had groups of students that have traveled um, all over the place. So um, whether it be uh, Italy or, um, Gosh, I'm forgetting some of the trips right now. There's Italy or uh, uh, Ireland or any country um, or really even nationally. The reality is, is that these are trips that the kids are experiencing. It's typically happening in June and it's, it's usually a 10 day long opportunity for the students. And many times it's the first time they've traveled without, without a parent or a family member. So it's a really wonderful experience for the kids to really, you know, take on some of that, that independence. It's also um, a, a great bonding experience for the students. So it's a, a wonderful time for them to come together and bond around a, a common experience and travel is a, a great way to do it. So that is an opportunity that often is available to our students uh, at, at Hilltop. So I, I've kind of talked a, a lot about Hilltop and I'm gonna give you all, I, I've been talking a lot. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point and I'm gonna give you all the opportunity if you have any questions right now about the academic program, whether you unmute yourselves or, or, um, or put it in um, a chat, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the academic program or, the travel experiences or, or the community at Hilltop at, at large. Any questions so far? Okay. So at this point, I'm gonna to to reshare my screen and I um Okay, and I see a, a statement from from uh, Mr. Hess and talking about um, uh, his son having difficulty writing by hand. And um, there's a lot of ways that that we address that. Um, so we have students that are dysgraphic on on campus. So the physical act of writing is a challenge. The laptop is a wonderful, wonderful resource for a lot of these kids. Uh, we do often have our students work with our OT in uh, directly. So she is working with them with the you know actual writing component. But the other piece is that she is also working with them on how how to type so that that way that is proficient and how to use that speech to text functionality on their computer. It, it sometimes can be a little bit tricky, but the reality is, is that it allows um, students to use the technology to support their learning. Um, math is often the, the challenge there because sometimes it's really hard with math. It's hard to avoid the act of writing, especially as you get further along in those, those math classes and the problems become really, really long and dense. So we often have those students, again, work with our OT and our math teachers to, to say, okay, how, what do we do? Sometimes it's a different um, type of paper. Sometimes it's, it's more space. We work with the students and figure out what it is that they need so that that way we can support them appropriately and they can then show us what it is that they, what they know. Any other questions? Okay. 
So we will be available at the at the end of this too. We're all going to be here. So if there are questions that come up, um, please let us know. I am going to to reshare my screen and um, uh, turn it over to Brian, who is going to talk to you about. Um, I'm having trouble with my little thing right now. I do not. There we go. Um, and he's going to tell you about the summer adventure programs that are available to all of our to all students. Brian, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll start off with a little bit of a caveat today. Um, you know, we do intend absolutely to have a summer program to offer this year. Of course, we don't know what that looks like, but we are in the middle right now of planning for a variety of different outcomes. Uh, I don't know what they are yet because they're kind of in the beginning stages, but much like Cindy did, we're going to talk about uh, the Summer Adventures program as it stands right now and what we are hoping to be able to do when uh, June 22nd hits. Uh, this year, our camp is running from June 22nd to July 31st. It's a six-week program. We have three different programs available, and we can cover students who are entering grade two all the way up to postgraduate. So first off, I'm going to talk about the, our basic summer camp program, which is a traditional uh, day camp. Uh, as a, Again, as I said, this one is for grades two through nine. Uh, our day starts around 9 a.m. and goes to about 3.15. However, we do have available before care and after care that can extend the day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for families who need it. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about the kind of activities that we offer. Overall, um, we, uh, we focus on activities that develop age-appropriate social skills, and uh, what, we, what we do that's different than other summer programs is that we focus a lot on teaching these social skills within the context of the activity. Uh, we do not um, teach individual groups or social skills classes. So for example, you see a list up on the screen there of potential um, activities that we offer like outdoor games, nature walks, Pokemon Go, fun science, video production, STEM, Minecraft, model building, arts and crafts, cooking. We have ESY math and writing support. Um, in all of those things, you know, you may be doing taking a cooking class, but it, as appropriate, we're also teaching the social skills within that context, which is uh, something really unique about us. This year, uh, we are off. We are kind of changing up our summer camp program a little bit to offer uh, kind of sub programs or tracks that focus on specific things. So families this year will have this summer will be able to choose between a program that focuses on um, STEM and science a program that focuses on arts and crafts and other sort of creative endeavors, and then a, another program that will focus on out, being outdoors and playing games and, and you know, taking walks in the park and things like that. What we're, we're giving family, families also the opportunity to participate in all of them. So even though we're a six-week program, you can mix and match the programs that you want to be involved in. You, you know, you're not stuck with six weeks of STEM if you want to do Two of each program, that's great. If you want to do five of STEM and one of arts and crafts, also great. Um, we're also going to give the opportunity to change things up too. So if uh, if you do sign up for certain programs but decide, you know, maybe your student decides after a couple of weeks if that program is not for them, we are going to be flexible as well. So that's a, a new fun thing that we're trying to introduce this year that we think will um, you know really make kids excited to come to camp every day and have a, a, a little more fun. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. All right, this is uh, something that uh, that the kids really enjoy. We have daily required instructional and recreational swim periods. So that means that uh, swimming every day for all campers in grades two through nine is a double period. The first period is um, uh, straight the swim lessons uh, taught by one of our uh, Hilltop teachers, Mr. Jim Riley. Uh, and then the second period is uh, a recreational free swim time just to kind of play games and the kids get to have time socializing in the pool. It's a lot of fun. Uh, most of our kids really look forward to, to that time of the day. It's really, really popular. Um, <clears throat> which actually leads me to another point I'd like to make. One thing that really sets us apart, our summer program apart from other programs, is that we have a staff that is very highly trained. Uh, the majority of our staff comes from Hilltop. We have many of our Hilltop teachers stay on board for the summer to be able to provide some a, a continuity uh, throughout the, the summer of our Hilltop program. But the, our other counselors come from other area schools. We have ca um, clinicians who come from the school district of um, Phoenixville, I believe. And we have, um, you know, we 
at, at the very least, our, our counselors are, in, you know, in high school or college programs like education programs, clinical programs, or psychology programs. We do not have high school counselors like other programs do. Um, if any high school counselors that we do have are counselors in training whose job it is to support the, the counselors and kind of provide an extra hand for larger groups. Um, we, are, we have a very, uh, a very large staff. I think it's approximately three, three campers per counselor, uh, depending on the activity. And if we have a larger activity, we always add some extra counselors in there to maintain that ratio. Uh, so next slide, please. <clears throat> We also focus on weekly social goal setting. So like I said, we have a clinician on, on staff who meets with all of the students either informally or formally individually throughout the week, but also as counselors, the counselors themselves check in with the students and the, ca the campers throughout the day to see what their goals are and um, how they're progressing on it. For some kids, it may be as simple as, uh, to this week, I want to join a Gaga game because we, we have a Gaga court on campus. It gets full of kids really quickly. And for some students, that can be really kind of overwhelming to see how many students are playing in that court. And then it can be um, difficult for them to jump into the game and participate. So their goal may be, I want to join this game and we're going to provide every sort of support that we can to help them get in there and feel comfortable doing so. And then, you know, the next week or the, after that goal is met, we're going to focus on something that maybe moving up a step a little stronger, like, you know, maybe, maybe I want to make a friend this week and we will provide the support that they need to do it. Uh, that Again, that happens within um, classes or activities, but it also happens on a one-on-one -on -one basis or a small group basis as needed. And it's uh, something really effective for our kids and really helps push them out of their, their comfort zone a little bit. But they also know that they have the support available to them if that becomes, uh, you know, a little scary for them. Um, so that's, that's kind of what the summer camp program is about. Uh, we also do weekly field trips on Friday. So every Friday, the entire camp uh, whether it's the summer program or our older programs, which I'll talk about in a moment, we all get on a big bus and we go somewhere fun for the day. Uh, it could be somewhere like uh, Dorney Park is one of our most popular trips. We go to the Franklin Institute every summer to see their uh, their special exhibits as well as their regular exhibits. We've been to the zoo. We've been to the aquarium. One of our most popular trips last summer was we just went to the Plymouth Meeting Mall for the day. And uh, you know, some kids went to the movies, some kids went to the escape rooms, mm -hmm. some kids did um, Legoland, and we had some kids going to Dave and Buster's, and then they switched and got to do a few other things. But we also had the opportunity um, to teach the kids how to do some you know, important social skills, like how to order food at the food court at the mall if they needed support with that. We were there to provide that support and they got that practice so they could do it themselves, which was really valuable. Um, <clears throat> so that the, the Friday trips are always one of the most uh, popular times of the year. And on our last Friday, uh, the campers go bowling for the morning while a few of us stay back and set up a full camp cookout so that uh, all the families come around noon. We have burgers and hot dogs and the kids show off some of the things that they've done, be it art projects. Uh, we did have a music activity one year where the kids got to perform for everybody who came uh, and parents go and play basketball and Gaga with their kids and it lasts for hours. It's, it's a great time and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's our summer camp program in a nutshell. Let's talk a little bit next about the Pathways to Independence program. <clears throat> Pathways to Independence is, again, a six-week program. This is for our older students. It's for students who are entering grade 10 through postgraduate. This one focuses on college exploration and the development of social, life, and executive functioning skills. The, uh, like the keystone or the capstone of this program is that it features a one-week college living experience at Cabrini. So in other words, on Monday morning of the last week of, of camp, everybody shows up, they go to Cabrini, and they live there for the week until Friday. Uh, it starts off with, you know, the the counselors are there to kind of walk the, the campers from place to place and help them get to the, you know, to the cafeteria or get where they have to go. They still do their activities and they have their, um, you know, their classes and things like that on campus. But by the end of the week, they're expected to be able to get everywhere independently. So um, by Thursday or Friday, they are not going to have somebody to walk them to the cafeteria. They're going to have to be able to do that on their own. But the, the five weeks leading up to this experience are designed to, um, you know, 
build those those skills so that they have them when the time comes. They will do things like learn how to budget by going to Dave and Buster's with a like a card that has twenty dollars on it, and their goal is to make that twenty dollars last at Dave and Buster's for an hour. Um, and I am an adult, and I can tell you that making twenty dollars <laughs> last at Dave and Buster's for an hour can be difficult. So uh, it's a it's a really uh, good thing for them to do, but it's also something fun because you know they're playing video games, and that's a great time for everybody. Uh, but as you can see in the pictures on the screen here, they also take day trips to go. Um, you know, they went to a, a yogurt uh, store, frozen yogurt store last summer or a couple summers ago to learn a little to practice that um, that skill of being able to order something and buy something. They have been focusing in recent summers on doing some college specific things. Um, for example, one of the little fun projects that the kids really, really enjoyed was they learned how to uh, make grilled cheese using an iron, <laughs> as you might do if you were in, in college, which then the the campers absolutely loved it. It was one of the things that they talked about for weeks afterwards. But they do a lot of fun little projects like that. Now, this is a much smaller program where our summer camp may have 50 students in it. Uh, this one tends to have between only 10 and 15. Because of that, it means it's highly individualized. And the actual content and the skills that are being taught and how they're taught is different from year to year. Because we often have students who are Hilltop students who come to this program for the second year in a row. So we do a lot of things to mix it up so that it can stay fresh uh, for, those, for those campers. Um, <clears throat> every Monday, the, uh, the kids in the Pathways to Independence program, as well as the Summer Innovators program, which I'll talk about in a moment, they will also be, um, they go to college visits, area colleges where they can get to the, to the campus, visit it for a few hours, and come back within the allotted camp time. Um, that's also something that's, uh, you know, the parents have really enjoyed, the kids have really enjoyed it. For the Pathway students, it really gives them something to talk about throughout the week because then as the activities are going on, you know, there's something that the teachers and the counselors can can reference these, these trips that they took to make those lessons kind of uh, more concrete and more tangible, uh, which we found has been uh, pretty effective. Um, so that's pretty. That's pathways uh, again in, in a nutshell. I'll talk next really briefly about um, summer innovators. Again, this is they do the same. You know, uh, they'll also participate in those Friday field trips with us. They'll also participate in those Monday college visits. Um, but the summer innovators program is um, this is more designed to build teamwork and leadership skills. Uh, this is for students who are entering the 11th grade or above. Uh, this summer we are in the process of. Uh, reimagining this program and um, building uh, something new and exciting. In, in the past, it focused a lot on problem solving through um, robotics and using the Lego Mindstorms. Um, one of the things that was really effective was the kids would each build a robot and then pass it off to one of their partners, and their partner would have to purposefully put bugs into the code and you know, basically break their robot and then give it back so that the person then had to go through and learn how to solve the problem, figure out, figure out what was wrong, and have that kind of perseverance and attention to detail to be able to fix their creation. This will still, this will be, a still be a part of the program, um, but we're going to be adding some new things, 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 things to keep it interesting. For example, I'm going to take you off of my headset. Okay, now can you hear me again? Okay, good. Um, so we're going to be adding some new activities this year. One of them that was really effective last year was uh, Ms. Amy Gillespie gave the kids a tent with no instructions and took them up onto the field at Hilltop and said, your job is to figure out how to put this tent together without any help, no instructions. You got to figure out how to do it. Um, it's that's a, a very it was the kids loved it first of all it, it was really but it was also very effective to teach them how to solve problems and how to work together you know we found that some campers were um automatically entering leadership roles while others uh you know were learning how to to take direction how to give direction and um it, it was it was a lot of fun but they learned a lot out of it too which was really great so that's pretty much all of our summer program um some basic um some other general information you know, we do accept uh, 
a district funding for students who receive ESY funding. So if you want to contact me directly at either camp at hilltopprep.org or summer adventures at hilltopprep.org, I'm happy to walk you through that process. Um, does anybody have any questions? Either you can type them in the text or unmute your microphone and ask, and uh, we can go from there. Okay, so I'm going to send an email out to everybody with a copy of our brochure and you know uh, maybe a link to our website. And um, if you if you know if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me then. And if you think of any questions in the meantime, again the email is summeradventures at hilltopprep.org, and I uh, look forward to hearing from you. So thanks. So I am going to present my screen again. Thank you, Brian. Um, and turn it over to Meredith. So she can learn a little bit more about our admissions process. I'm not sure what's happening. There we go. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Again, I just want to go through um, briefly about our admissions process. Some of you have already begun the process, um, and thank you for that. If you're still considering it, please know the admissions committee is meeting weekly, we are reading files, we are doing online um, virtual interviews as well. Um, we would like to keep things going as you're working with your school districts as well. So in our case, our first step would be to attend an open house, which you are doing. Um, you can also complete our online application. If you go to our website, there is a button where you can press inquire now. Um, and that will take you to the page to create an inquiry form and application for your student, or you can go to our website under the admissions tab um, where it will take you directly there as well. So once you've completed the online inquiry form and application, we need um, supporting documentation from your family. And you will provide this to us. You can ask your school or school district to send it to us if you'd like, but it um, typically will come from the parents. We need the most recent IEP or GIEP if your student has one. Um, and typically, if it's been within the last two years. So if your student has been in private school and is going into the ninth grade, but their last IEP was in the fifth grade, um, that's not going to help us as much. If you'd like to include it, you absolutely can. What we like to also see is growth. So um, the most recent IEP, um, the most recent um, psychoeducational evaluation or neuropsych. What we're looking for is their cognitive ability. So the WISC-5 is what's out now, the WISC-5, as well as um, achievement testing. So that's the WEOT or the Wilcox-Johnson. And we'd like for those to be within the last two years. Our kids grow and mature. And there are times where your student that was going into fifth grade would not be an appropriate fit for Hilltop. But now that they're going into eighth and they've had so much growth, um, the new testing will, will show us that growth. Um, and we would be able to go through our admissions process using the most recent information for your student. We also need report cards from the previous year as well as the current year. Um, we like for, um, letters of recommendation from teachers, however, in this climate, it's okay. And even if we were in school, Many school districts and schools don't allow teachers to um, provide letters of recommendation, so we'll use the narrative from uh, the IEP as well as report cards. So don't get don't really get hung up on that. Um, if you your student is seeing an outside therapist, we would love a letter of recommendation from the therapist that's also within the application. But if um, we also ask for permission to speak with the therapist uh, from you, so you can get you'll get a release form that will give us permission to speak with your student therapist. As Cindy said, um, the, our communication with professionals comes from our guidance counselors um, or from, from our counselors, and we really try to keep the message consistent. We try to um, make sure that the entire team is supporting the student that includes the outside therapist. Once we've reviewed all of those documents, it looks like a good fit on paper, and sometimes we're just not even sure and just need to clap eyes on the student, we will schedule an interview. Typically, they will come to the school, take a tour, attend community meeting, um, and right now we're doing online interviews. And then as we get back to normal when or whatever that looks like, we will schedule visitation days. And so these are shadow days where our students would spend the day with 
a current student going through the classes. They do some assessments for us, which we will now send home for writing as well as math. Um, and also we do vis visitation days during the summer. So it might not even happen during the school year. We are able to do shadow days during the summer where they spend time in summer camp. Um, for some of our applicants, we use summer camp as a way to get started working socially with the student as well. Um, but we're pretty flexible. We're hilltop. We can absolutely accommodate um, parents throughout the admissions process. We are on your timetable um, as you are working for funding with your school district, if you are. If not, uh, we also do offer up to 50% financial aid. Um, for our students, and you, you apply using the SFS form. Um, that's basically our admissions process in a nutshell. In August, we will have our new family night where uh, students will come, they'll get their schedules, they'll be with the student ambassador and go through all of their classes. We have more of a garden party type feel for parents where you guys can meet with the, the faculty in the different departments as well, and just a nice introduction um, to Hilltop the week before classes begin. Um, are there any questions about the admissions process? I see some questions that were typed in the text, um, so we will go through those as well. Thank you, Cindy. Um, does anyone have any questions right now? No? Okay, so one of the questions in the text was, what are the school demographics and how does Hilltop address socioeconomic diversity? Tom or Cindy, do you want to address that? I, I can answer that. Um, so sure, go ahead. the and Tom, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so really our we have a really diverse group of students is I guess the best way and easiest way to 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 put it. Um, the our students are coming from from a, a, a wide geographic area. Um, so there, we have kids coming from as far east as southern New Jersey, as far south as Delaware, um, as far north as Allentown, and as far west as, say, uh, like Reading and, and, and Lancaster area. So our kids are, are, are traveling quite a distance. Um, as Meredith mentioned, some of our students are funded by their, their districts. So we do have students. Um, that are, are are being funded by their districts and um, need um, lunches provided for them and and uh, breakfast and and things like that provided to them. We also have that other end of the spectrum, so it is a wide range of students in terms of um, socioeconomic diversity, and it's something that that we are constantly talking about and and focusing on. We do want all of our students to be part of the Hilltop. Um, community and be able to participate in activities. Um, so if there's ever a time when there's um, an activity that that may be out of reach financially for a student, um, it's just a matter of, of contacting us and, and are trying to provide that that support so they can still participate. Meredith, you're muted right now. Sorry, we had a, a, a minor glue, glue spill from Kraft. Uh, sorry about that. Um, what? I have heard postgraduate students mention several times during this presentation. Can you please speak to the age range and percentage of the student population that are in the Horizon Post Grant program? And are these students in another level of classes? So the Horizons program is really individualized. Um, so it, it is a small group of students. This year we have uh, five Horizon students that are um, part of of the program, and their programs vary mightily. Um, for some students, they are really on campus rarely, um, which meaning that they are at um, a local college. We have partnerships with with different schools. So we have some kids at Delaware County Community College. We have some kids at, at Cabrini University. Um, it, it varies depend, and we have other partnerships as well. Um, kids can also take uh, classes online. So it might be that they're going to classes and they're only coming to Hilltop um, a couple days a week to, to get some of that executive function support and some counseling support and things along that nature. Um, for other students, it, it really um, is is vastly different. So we do have some kids where 
they might be taking those classes, but they're also on campus at Hilltop uh, taking classes as well and receiving additional support. So they work really closely. All of the kids work really closely with um, the person that at Hilltop that directs this program, Amy Gillespie. She oversees our, our, our post-grad program, and she works to make those those programmatic um, decisions with the family. So it is a decision that that you are they are all making. Um, for some of our, our students that are in the post-grad program, uh, we do have a, a dorm. Um, it's a five-day-a-week dorm that, that we offer at Hilltop as well. It's on the, the third floor of the, the mansion on campus. And we do have some of those post-grad students that are living in the dorm, um, and then they're also off campus taking classes and doing things. But it is a really individualized program. As I said, this year there were five students in, the, in this program, um, and um, their, each one of their programs is vastly different than the next. I'd like to add for uh, the summer programs that, you know, um, the postgraduate students in summer camp are a very small percentage. Um, in fact, we you know while we are open to, to campers of a variety of ages, we've really only in practice had postgraduate students who had just graduated high school. So I guess going into that, um, what you would might call 13th grade. We haven't had anybody beyond that, though we are open to it. Uh, and for that, for the most part, those uh, campers have participated in the Pathways to Independence program specifically to learn skills to prepare for their upcoming college experience. Um, so that's kind of um, how it how it uh, comes about in over the summer. Okay, and the last question I have here is, what is the college enrollment rate for Hilltop Prep students? It's actually um, pretty high. About 95% of our students are, are going on to some form of um, college program. It varies. Um, each year and it varies by by the students. So some students are looking for um, shorter two-year programs while other students are, are looking for a, a four-year college. Um, Amy Gillespie also um, works and does all of our transition transition service work and they um, she works with the kids to find the the right fit for, for each of them. So she's often taking kids off campus but more importantly we're often inviting colleges on campus and college reps on campus to come and speak with our students um, during our, often our mentor period so that they get a sense of of what that that college um, might be like um, again she also takes them off campus so she can all so they can see this is what a small campus looks like this is what a large campus looks like um, here are all the different programs that they are that that are that are offered so they get a really good next fit um, for that next stage at Hilltop. So it could run anywhere from community college to a large um, four-year school. I believe, Meredith, in our admissions packet, there's a list of colleges. Is that correct? Yes, that will go out in the packet to everybody this week. So you will get a sense of the colleges that, um, that our students have uh, attended um, in the last few years, those that they've been accepted to, as well as those that they have, have attended. So that will be a good resource that will be coming to you very soon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So with the admissions um, piece, when you're ready to go ahead and email, you can email them directly to me at mfitpatrick at hilltopprep.org. I will distribute them to our admissions committee for review and then follow up with you um, with their recommendations. Um, also, please stay connected with us. Um, Hilltop is a very active Facebook page. We're posting things that our kids are doing during our social distancing, ways that they're giving back to their community. Um, it's a very interesting time for our kids right now, and they're really stepping up, and they're really keeping our community together with different Zoom chat rooms um, that they're setting up on their own. Um, and as much as our kids are working on social skills and social needs, they've really kind of taken to um, communicating and keeping in touch with each other now that they don't have each other every day. Um, they are really trying to make connections online as well. So follow us on Facebook. There's also an Instagram um, page if you'd like to follow us there just to stay connected with the Hilltop community. Um, 
I will be emailing you information from today's open house and it'll have our student profile in there so you can kind of see where our kids are testing and, and going to school as well. I'll send you the college um, list for you guys, the LD chart I already sent, um, and then a link to our brochure. And if you have any questions, please, by all means, we, I have time, email me. Um, you can absolutely reach out. If you'd like to do another Google Hangout, I'm more than happy to set that up and we can speak virtually. Um, and we're definitely continuing interviews online as well. Are there any other questions? Tom, would you, do you have anything else you'd like to add as we close? I, I would um, like to just say thank you again to everybody who participated this morning. And we're also gonna try something new, and this is a message to the parents themselves. Um, some families are looking for an excuse to get out of the house for a short period of time. Uh, I would urge you to drive over to the campus and just drive around. We are more than just a single building on the property. This is a campus approach and campus program. The other thing we're going to try, and each of the parents that are in the meeting this morning will be getting an email personally from me. Um, if the family is so inclined and would be interested in a single family centric tour, I promise to keep my safe six feet distance. We can set up a time. You, I would meet you at the front door and walk you around and show you the elements of the program of the campus that match the program you just heard about. Uh, it will not be a group presentation. It will be done one family at a time. Some families may not be comfortable with that, and that's all. That's all fine. But I'm, I'm happy. I live here on campus, and I'd be happy to schedule some time. So you'll be getting an email from me with this information. And if it's something you'd like to try, I'm more than willing to schedule a time to do that. But thank you again. Oh, thank you for your time and for joining us this morning to learn about Hilltop, social distancing and all. Um, we're all in this together and I do appreciate you taking time out of your day to learn about our, our school on the Hill. And I look forward to being in contact with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Take good care. Stay well. Bye bye. Take you care. Too. All right, so just us now? It is just go. us now. All right, there we go. Down okay. to three. I thought that went yeah, well. Yeah, that just removed them. I was like, well, it's over now. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do think it went well. It was a little bit longer, <clears throat> but I think that was okay because all of the parents stayed. Um, okay. By the time we got to camp, the professionals had exited, but the parents were there. There were still seven parents remaining. So I think it was actually really, it, I think it did what it was supposed to. Right. I think the thing that, that kind of, well, the, the one thing that I kind of, the introductions at the beginning I found were hard. The other thing I thought was hard was the waiting at the beginning. So yeah. I, I think the only thing I was thinking of is if, if we have to do this again in May right. or whenever, right. ever again, um, yeah. the only thought I had thought was, do we, do we take it over to zoom? Cause I think zoom has a virtual yeah. waiting room, correct? I think um, so. I like Zoom too, just for the ability to see. Right. And um, Dave and I, Dave and Edutech and I have been talking about Zoom, and they're having some serious issues right now with their encryption uh, and their privacy. Uh, and they're uh, actually having. And Meredith, we're still morning. recording. You might want to unrecord. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure did. Okay. I actually read Thank before you. we started this that the FBI has had to open an investigation.